It's my pleasure today to, to introduce a very distinguished speaker. Um, and th there's, a, uh, there's a short introduction and then a longer introduction. Short, short. And, and the short, short introduction is uh, he, he came to Berkeley to do physics and then he met Art Rosenfeld. <laughs> So he, good. Um, this is Dr. Ashok Godville. He has a doctorate in physics from UC Berkeley. He's the director of the Environmental Energy Technologies Division at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, right up the hill. He's a professor of civil and environmental engineering and the Andrew and Virginia Rudd Family Foundation professor, professor of safe water and sanitation at UC Berkeley. He has substantial experience in technical, economic, and policy research on energy efficiency and its implementation, particularly in developing countries. For example, the utility compact, the utility-sponsored compact fluorescent lamp leasing programs that he pioneered are being successfully implemented by utilities in several East European and developing countries. He has several patents and inventions to his credit, among them are the UV waterworks, a technology to inexpensively disinfect drinking water in the developing countries for which he received the Discoverer Award in 1996 for the most significant environmental invention of the year, as well as the Popular Science Award for Best of What is New 1996. In recent years, he's worked on ways to inexpensively remove arsenic from Bangladesh drinking water and on fuel-efficient stoves for Darfur. Um, and most recently, he has um, been inducted into the National Inventors uh, Hall of Fame, uh, again, for his many inventions in, in uh, things for the developing world. Um, and he's distinguished by the fact that he's still alive, <laughs> since, since uh, many of the people inducted into that National Inventors Hall of Fame are done so uh, posthumously. So, so I'm, I'm glad we, we are old friends. <laughs> we are old friends. Uh, I, I've known him since he was a graduate student, and uh, he knows, has known me since I was barely dry behind the ears, and we both are linked together by a wonderful man named Art Rosenfeld, who's a, uh, one of the great leaders in the area of energy efficiency and in shaping California's energy policy. So it's a, it's a great pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague, Ashok Godgill. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Carl. Uh, so welcome to our uh, folks who are uh, viewing this on the web, uh, as well as uh, people who are viewing it uh, at other campuses. And uh, what I'm going to do is, of course, have to change to my presentation, not Carl's presentation, which was a nice, compact one slide. Here is mine. And we're going to presenter, slideshow, presenter view. Here it is. So I'm going to talk quickly in the hope of trying to finish my slides in time for you to be able to ask me questions. And um, as the title says, I'm trying to summarize what can I say in 45 minutes or 30, 30 to 40 minutes about lessons learned from doing three projects, drinking water treatment, fuel efficient cook stoves, and energy efficient lights. What are the lessons drawn? So this talk is not about those projects. Each of those projects themselves is a, a decadal effort, uh, usually spanning more than 10 years, starting from an idea to, to testing things in a lab, to testing things in small scale pilots, and then going to scale. Going to scale is business shorthand for affecting or benefiting a very large number of people. So if, if that's what each project is about, I could be giving lectures about each one of those, but that's not the point here, right? So I'll start off by giving an impressive quote from a very well-known person. 
and I'm going to repurpose this code. Some of you have seen it. Uh, I'm going to repurpose the code to say the word successful technology means not just something that succeeds in the lab, but actually has societal impact. So if your technology, your innovation, your invention that you, you hope to have a societal impact is going to be successful, is not about PR. Okay, so that is the first thing. It's, and there are a bunch of ways in which one can fail when you try to make it actually work in the, in the real world, going beyond the laboratory. Uh, the second way in which I'm repurposing this is that this great quotation, this great man, when he st said it, uh, for that quotation, he meant nature cannot be fooled. He meant laws of nature. And I'm going to include into this things beyond the laws of nature. Is going to include into this laws by which us human beings work as society, social structures, institutions, organizations with our own motives. Okay. All of this is a complex. And if you want to take the technology out of the lab and succeed in the field and go to scale, it's not about PR and it's not about understanding simply uh, fooling nature or even fooling the way people behave. And the quote is from Richard Feynman. And this is his diagnostics about why we had this catastrophic disaster uh, of the Challenger shuttle. And when he was on that committee, this is a photograph of him showing that particular piece of seal that actually becomes rigid, uh, inflexible, uh, when the weather turns cold. And his statement was rejected by the committee, and he was forced to put it in an appendix. So you would notice that the citation is actually uh, Appendix F, which is his only <laughs> statement, because they wouldn't include it in the main report. <laughs> And you are saying it's not about PR, it's about getting it right. So it is about getting it right. And, and as you'll see, I learned in my own small way, uh, getting it right is a lot more complicated. Okay? So to be useful, effective, and scalable, technologies, innovations must share each of the following four characteristics. They have to be affordable, technically effective, of course, you'll be surprised how many cookstoves claim to be efficient and are actually not, and how many filters claim to remove arsenic and actually don't. Uh, they have to be robust in the operating environment in which your technology is going to be placed, which means that there may not be an Ace Hardware store nearby, right? <laughs> there may be no electricity. There may be no Phillips screwdriver in the village where you hope your technology to work. And lastly, it has to be culturally appropriate. My argument against this list is that anybody can close their eyes and think of these four characteristics. So I would say, surely these are all correct, but they are fatally incomplete. If you take these four, if you don't take these four, of course, it's, it's a disaster. Don't, don't even try, right? So you have to do those. But this is a fatally incomplete list. And... and much more is needed, and that's where my talk comes uh, to, to its key lessons. And, and following uh, the style of business presentation, I'm going to tell you the conclusions first. So three lessons learned. One is, and this is all about technologies for developing countries, for poor people in poor communities. So none of this applies if you are trying to sell something to the creme de la creme in New Delhi, okay? They take their vacations uh, in Switzerland. So everything works for them. That's fine. So <laughs> a successful technology design and implementation should not be separated. They're tightly intertwined. And uh, even the designer must consider from the start the vision and needs for successful implementation. And I'll give you examples by those three multi-decadal projects of how these lessons were applied and what, what, why I was led to these conclusions. Uh, secondly, there are social factors as, as critical for a technology success as are engineering science factors. And if you don't know what the social factors are that, that define the, or constrain the space uh, of your design parameters or implementation model, then it's as likely to fail as ignoring laws of nature. 
And lastly, uh, the design engineer's ignorance of horribly complicated things for engineering people, which we are never taught. Never even if you, you know, you can get your PhD without knowing any of this stuff. Political economy, behavioral economics, organizational behavior, institutional imperatives, cultural norms and social drivers. Nobody teaches these. So you got to read between the lines. You got to walk in the shoes of the people whom you hope will adopt your technology and make a large scale impact. If you don't do this and you don't think about these matters, they could prove fatal flaws when you try to get a new technology to leave uh, the lab and meet the real world. And you could have catastrophic outcomes. So I'm going to give you three illustrative examples. In all my projects, uh, and I'll, as, I, as I said, they are about a decade long in length. And they are going to be highly compressed uh, slides describing what the problem was and what we ended up doing. But there will be a connection to what leads to uh, the earlier issues. First is the safe, uh, affordable, safe drinking water. Context is uh, more than a billion people lack access to safe drinking water. Uh, close to two million people annual deaths from diarrheal diseases. Almost all waterborne. Almost all deaths from uh, of children below age five. This photograph is a cholera-ridden uh, child in children's ward in Dhaka, the largest hospital in Dhaka is called the cholera hospital. And this is in December, which is not the cholera season, and all the beds were full even then. And this is 2009, so it's not like you know 1970s kind of photograph. So if you want to have a technology that actually disinfects water, which is where I started attacking this problem uh, back in 1993, it was clear that if I were to think of a way to disinfect water where the technology was at the level of the household, so each house would have a way to disinfect water, uh, maintenance becomes a lot more complicated, point one. Point two, people are impatient. They want the water to be disinfected quickly, which means the water disinfection device is sitting around for a long time unused. You cannot have a high throughput and high hourly use at the same time, which means your capital is lying around unused most of the time, if you think of it as a capital, which adds to the cost of your water, unit cost. So in other words, it, the, the logic of keeping the cost affordable and, and the device maintained <laughs> drives you away from household individual disinfection. It drives you to a, to a setup where you will want the capital amortization high, which means you want a high duty cycle for the device so that you'll be actually using uh, the device 20 hours a day. Uh, and that actually fits well with the fact that people are already walking to a village well to collect their water. Now, instead of that, they start walking to your kiosk with the device, which is disinfecting water 20 hours a day. Then the capital amortization gets spread over uh, a long duty cycle, cost drops. And so that's what went into the design in addition to a few design principles. So the design criteria which we used were that there's no compromise on quality. It must exceed or meet WHO and US EPA criteria. It must be energy efficient. Our end point was seven, four cents would disinfect a ton of water. So there's, there's one metric ton, that is 10 liters uh, per person per day, uh, which, is, which is generous, two and a half liters per person per day, would disinfect. Uh, uh, you would need to disinfect annually 3.65 3 tons of water. And that's still going to be less than a quarter, uh, quarter of a dollar. Reliable mature components, we must treat unpressurized water, must have rapid throughput, must have low and simple maintenance once every three months and you don't want somebody uh, more sophisticated than a fourth grade trained person to do it and no overdose risk and no moving parts so nothing fails, no bearings to wear out, no motors to burn out and so on. So all of these led to design and of course fail safe. Led to design of this device called UV Waterworks is about the size of a microwave oven, a kitchen domestic microwave oven and it disinfects 
uh, enough water for 10 liters per person per day for 2,000 people. So this is how people were collecting water before uh, this device was installed in this village, Bominapadu, uh, in Andhra Pradesh. This is how they collect water uh, from, from these liter jugs, uh, 10 liter jugs uh, in 2005 in the same village. This is the nicest building in the village. People still live in mud walled roof, uh, attached roof huts, uh, but they are very proud. This is the best, best building in town. And this is the inside view. These are the three UV waterworks that you saw. Same device here, lake in the back or pond in the back from which they collect the water. Uh, and in 2007, uh, they were selling water for profit for 0.2 US cent per liter. Uh, and that included the cost of amortized capital, operating costs, electricity, uh, maintenance, consumables, salaries of two part-time employees. And this is what you can achieve if you got it to work right. But what it takes is thinking about uh, an endpoint model that will actually work, working backwards that make it affordable, make it sustainable, make it viable. And here are some kids uh, holding on to a water, water container. Uh, of course, the company that does this, licensed by the University of California, is, uh, does not speak Telugu. It does not speak Tamil. It's a California startup called Water Health. And you can check it out at waterhealth.com. And their model is, of course, work with a local nonprofit to make sure that you get community education in public health so that people will buy the water. Even at that low price, if they don't buy the water, you go bankrupt. Okay? So there is a big incentive for this company to actually work with these nonprofits and do the public education that says you get diarrhea and disease not because you walk in the sun on a hot summer day bareheaded, but because you drank some dirty water most likely. So all of that goes into the business model. A lot of national awards uh, also spread to now uh, three countries in Africa, beyond three countries in, in India. This is in uh, Pokwasi village near Accra. Uh, here are three U.S. senators uh, opening the 500th uh, water health center in India and uh, the color of the cans has changed to blue with this whatever they want, right? <laughs> a long way to go because we still have uh, lots of people without safe drinking water. Uh, this is the number of, this is the service capacity of the water health centers by year end. They started in year 2005 and by now they are more than 5 million people that they can serve for the first time. Uh, or the, the statistically, life saves about 1,000 per year. No longer charity can go to scale on its own, for-profit, affordable, safe, clean drinking water. Can be done, but requires fair amount of social engineering, fair amount of uh, paying attention to the social sciences and work very hand in glove between engineering and social sciences and business models. Okay, for most customers, this is the fact. I've been to a number of sites. This is the very first time that they have been able to actually have access to affordable, safe drinking water. Otherwise, their choice was you just can't afford it. You can't just you just suffer diarrheal diseases. The second example I'm going to give is about high-performance cook stoves uh, in Darfur, Sudan. The context is more than two billion, close to three billion, actually, cook on solid fuels. Uh, and in Darfur, this is not true for all of these 2 billion people. This is true for people in Darfur who are IDPs or internally displaced people. Uh, and in this case, a problem arose because uh, the, this is the landscape in, in Darfur, which is a, a desert region. And the IDPs are clustered in camps for safety. They get raw food, but not uh, fuel to cook their food with. So they must leave the safety of their camps and they get subjected to attacks by the Janjaweed. Uh, and if the men get caught by the Janjaweed, the men get killed. If women get caught, they get dishonored, uh, which is a code word for sexual violence. Uh, the trips last seven hours every other day. And this is how we got dragged into this because of the work in water. USAID said, can you do something about it? about this problem. I didn't know what I could do about a problem, but eventually it turned out that uh, extremely low efficiency cooking uh, 
which is just three stone fire, see three stones, and that's what is called three stone fire. Uh, this is the oldest way in which you can cook food, three stones supporting a pot, fire underneath. It's also one of the dirtiest, that is to say most smoky, uh, healthfully damaging ways in which one can cook food. And efficiency is 5% to 7%. So I figured, hey, you should be able to push it to 20% at least. Uh, and that's how we said, let's get involved. But again, if you want to be successful, it's not enough to make a stove that works in the lab at 20% efficiency. It better be acceptable to these women, which means it should work with their fuel, their pots, their food, their cooking style. If they don't want to cook rice and you give them a pot and a stove combination that works with rice, you fail. Again, look back at Feynman's code, okay? So, <coughs> we started working with fuel efficient stoves in 2005. I didn't want to invent a stove. I took a bunch of stoves out there, tested them, found that none of them was good enough for what they wanted or what I would have thought acceptable. We did side-by-side -side testing of a lot of stoves. Here is a stove from India. That's a three-stone fire, and there are two other stoves in the background. And the idea was how local women cook their food in their pots with their fuel using their style of cooking and, and competitively figure out what actually works. And not, none of this was good enough, but eventually it led to a stove that we iteratively learned with the women what is it that they wanted. So the stove was co-designed with the refugee women, and that's why it's called a Berkeley Darfur stove. And here is a, here is a picture of the stove. Uh, it cost $20 end to end from scratch all the way delivered to the women with training. Uh, and it saves them uh, about a dollar a day and has a life of about five years at least. We, we haven't been out there. Uh, so it's, it's worth about $1,725 uh, US dollars in saved fuel. And of course it offsets also about two tons of CO2 equivalent per year in terms of reduced emissions, but we don't count for that because we are we're still in the process of getting carbon credit for it. Okay, So this is the 14th version of the Berkeley Darfur stove. It went through all these iterations to get to the point where it meets their expectations and their criteria. This was built, the first thousand stoves were built in September of 2009. It took four years uh, between 2005 and 2009 is when the first stoves were built in Darfur by Darfur refugees whom we trained. Uh, and here is a stove in use. Uh, this is a typical shelter um, and there is a stove. And here are some stoves for distribution, um, ready for distribution waiting in an IDP camp. In parallel now we have set up one of the best labs in the world for uh, emissions measurements for biomass stoves. Uh, at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, and we measure at once per second frequency uh, a bunch of emissions, and the purpose there is to make an ultra clean stove that is about 10 times less smoky or emits le 10 times less smoke per meal than a standard stove does, and we have some hints of success on, in doing that as well, but that's a side effort. This is not the main project. The back to Berkeley Darfur stove. Here is data published at, by people at arm's length from US EPA, Jeter et al., published in Environmental Science and Technology 2012, showing a bunch of stoves they tested. But they are all stoves which use natural draft, which means they don't have a fan or a battery, and they use natural wood. That means no pelletized wood or nothing special, just pelletized wood, natural draft. And this is showing particulate emissions of size 2.5 microns or smaller in in aerodynamic diameter per unit energy delivered to the pot, that's this axis, and this is uh, carbon monoxide emissions. An ideal stove would be sitting there, Berkeley Darfur stove is here, and here are other stoves. So we are doing pretty good on that metric. Uh, also from that uh, paper, uh, US EPA, here is a stove, uh, same, same group of stoves now plotted on retail costs. Uh, and thermal efficiency, and we were aiming at about 20%. We are closer to 38%. We didn't believe, we said, yeah, is it really 38%? So we went back to the lab and repeated the test 10 times, and it is indeed 38%. <laughs> so it's good. Uh, and we are pretty good in this group. We are pretty low cost, and uh, we are pretty efficient. 
And this is the way the stoves are built. The idea of the philosophy all along is to build them as close to the end use point as possible. So these are uh, actually IDPs who are trained uh, and they're to, to make the stove. It's, a, it's an open dirt floor. The workshop is set up for our design. We send the equipment there. We train them there. This is in El Fasher in North Darfur. And here is the data from impact survey. Uh, 90, uh, 82 families surveyed. This is uh, baseline was in January 2010. Follow up after distribution was in July 2010. So they've been, they've been following using the stove for seven months. And they've been saving 95 cents per day on the average. So the ongoing story is that there is actually a non-profit. Remember the job of the university and job of the national lab as well is to generate knowledge and disseminate knowledge, not build stoves and disseminate stoves. That's not what we do. So there is a non-profit that is spun off from Berkeley, which is now in Oakland, was earlier in Berkeley, but they're right here, uh, close collaborators. And uh, by summer of 2014, there were more than 37,000 stoves in Darfur, uh, helping more than 200,000 family members. So uh, we include the family members as a whole group that is helped. And if you recall that each stove was worth about little more than $1,700, those stoves are putting more than $60 million in the pockets of these 200,000 people over the five-year life of the stoves. And on track to build uh, 40,000, more than 40,000 total stoves by end of 2014, we think we'll comfortably do, I say we because I'm one of the founders of this. <laughs> uh, we should be comfortably able to do 10,000 stoves a year, which is pretty decent uh, of where this could go. So what's, what's the key here? The key is don't mess with local priorities of how people like their food to be cooked. If they are wheat eaters and they like to eat flat bread, don't try to tell them to eat boiled rice because you figured out how to boil rice at a very high efficiency. Nah, that's not what you are about. You are about applying your engineering science and creativity and my engineering science and creativity as a team to work with those whom you wish to help to find out what is it that they want. And within limits of engineering science, figure out how to deliver it to them. If they want to eat bread, we got to figure out how to make bread. Okay, and if they if they want to build a stove by hand tools, which is you saw them doing that, you notice that the, all the edges of this stove are straight edges, uh, and that's because they bend the sheet metal with little tools called hand brake, the brake sheet metal brakes, so that they can simply bend the metal and then they revet it. Okay, so all of this stuff has a lot of nuances which are folded into the design of the stove. So that this is a stove that can accommodate a small pot when they make their uh, uh, sauce called mula, and they can make their um, mixed dough, which is heated on the fire called asida. All of those pots have to be accommodated on a single stove. So it's a multi-pot stove. It's designed to be locally assembled with hand tools. It's designed to work with large lateral force because asida is so viscous that when you stir it with that wooden stick, all the stoves we tested were tipping over, which is why it has these enormous big feet. This stove is very stable mechanically. All of that goes into the design and the dissemination model includes the fact that you want to increase their acceptance through incorporating their income so that they build their stoves and the precision cut of the metal IKEA style is made in Mumbai rather than the US, but more information is at the website of potentialenergy.org. The last project I'm going to talk about is uh, providing CFLs or compact fluorescent lamps for poor households in poor countries. And I want to start off by showing you this picture you have seen before, which is uh, a assembled photograph because there are clouds which you have to take photographs of Earth at night and there is nowhere night at Earth, all over the Earth at the same time anyways. So <laughs> you put all these pictures together and essentially it shows you where is light, electric lighting leaking out into space, right? Which is a, which is a surrogate for telling you where there is electricity. And uh, the important things to notice is, are of course the first world, Western Europe, United States, Australia, Japan, 
um, some hot spots um, in, in highly prosperous uh, cities, but otherwise huge areas of darkness uh, where lots of people live. So I'm going to superimpose on the same map, a map of the world showing you population density. And you notice now all of this stuff is absent, all of that stuff is absent from the previous map. Okay, so I'm, I'm pointing to this vacancy, this vacancy. Uh, anyways, so back to promoting efficient electric lighting in poor communities and poor countries. Why should we bother? Uh, a lot of people live in the dark. There are electrically short, electricity shortages everywhere around them. If we could use electricity efficiently, say five times more efficiently, that's what the rate is between CFL and an incandescent bulb, it will allow find as more homes to be lighted up. Uh, and because lighting in these countries is on peak, uh, that's when the demand is maximum already. When that demand jacks up, the grid goes down. So that forces the utility, which essentially is a government funded operation to invest more in power plants, draining resources from other infrastructure like schools and roads and hospitals. So why doesn't it happen on its own? Poor people have very high discount rates for future savings, as much as 150%, which means they are not going to invest today in expensive CFL to save electricity bills for the future because of discount rates are very high. So today's cash matters a lot because there is aversion to technological risk. If they bought a CFL and it failed, they are stuck with it. It's month's pay for them. Uh, there are big transaction costs, they don't understand what this new thing is, and then they get lifeline rates for electricity, which undercuts unsubsidized efficiency. So you are actually murdering efficiency by subsidizing electricity, and you are, you are actually doing the wrong thing if you are a planner, right? So we designed an experiment where the plan was, you, uh, if the utility subsidizes CFLs, and then CFLs save electricity, that means the utility is saving some money because they are now paying less subsidy on the lifeline rates. And you can run through the math and show that the avoided utility subsidies will offset some of the consumer costs and the rest of the costs can be a, a utility financing. So we did all the math, it looked great. Then it would be a win-win-win because the consumers win, the utility wins, the infrastructure wins. Uh, environment has less pollution. We tried this project, it's a catastrophe. It's a complete disaster. It's the first time, this is my first time that I tried to do something in the real world. And I not just stubbed my toe, I bloodied my nose. I fell on my face. It was really painful. It took me a long time to recover from, uh, psychologically, from that setback to say, oh my God, there are a lot more laws outside of laws of nature. Uh, in terms of not just legal laws, but how societies behave, how institutions behave. And if you want to really change the world, even economically, uh, even if everything was looking good in terms of economics, finance, and electrical engineering and physics, you still can fail catastrophically. And that was my lesson to wake up to say, my God, this is something much more interesting and bigger. And if you can get it right, it's really wonderful. So. The lesson from Bell was the last uh, of the third lessons that I summarized, which is even organizations and institutions have their own objectives, and some of them are stated, and some are beneath the surface, are hidden. And part of the skill in making things work in the real world is understanding not just the stated objectives, but the hidden objectives of organizations. Just to give one example with which you may be familiar, there are stated objectives for all non-profits saying we are in the interest of society, which is why we are tax, tax exempt. A lot of non-profits also have an objective that we want to survive and thrive, which means that we need to please our funders no matter whether we are benefiting the end beneficiary or not. So long as we please the funder, we keep on getting money in, we pay our staff, we are prosperous and good. And once in a while, these examples hit the news that some CEO of some fat nonprofit flies first class all over the world all the time, for example. But this is far more common than you think, and it's not limited to nonprofits at all. Okay. 
So need to understand both, take them into account, and many fields do take this into account, but in this particular area I'm talking about, you know, uh, we just been blind. So we, we recovered, we went to Mexico, we did it right, okay? And in Illumex we started to do a project where we actually got significant money, which was not really needed because we knew the analysis, but we have to say, hey, USAID is with us, World Bank is with us, now it looks cool, it looks sexy, you got these big sponsors behind you, which is wonderful. Nothing, nothing wrong here. And then we actually got a 10 million grant from GEF, so 23 million dollars uh, finally, and uh, we got uh, 2.4 million CFL sold in two and a half years, as opposed to an objective of 1.7. Uh, CFL prices have fallen, more variety of CFLs were available at the end. I'm not going to waste time on this slide, to sh but the, the bottom line is in the end, we ended up having about 16 million CFLs sold in just a few cities in Mexico. And then GEF and UNEP stepped in, created something called enlighteninitiative.org, and the goal is to get the whole world to phase out incandescence by 2016. Uh, so what's the summary of this project? Replacing one light bulb with a CFL, ordinary light bulb, 60 watts, uh, saves about 500 kilowatt hours of electricity worth about $75. Or fuel oil equivalent at the electric power plant of about 40 gallons of gas. So currently the estimated annual savings from CFL programs does define utility sponsored in the developing world to subsidize CFL. In 2011, there were $5 million per year and growing, and there were about 100 million customers. That means 100 million households impacted. And this will only grow, which just scratch the surface here. So back to where I started from. The recap, three lessons. Okay, pay attention. Uh, at the design stage, don't isolate implementation vision from design. Pay attention to social factors uh, for the technology success and pay attention to lots of non-engineering stuff because when you leave the lab and meet the real world, it's a much, much more complicated, hostile jungle where you don't know who's hiding behind what rock to come bite you <laughs> if, you <don't, laughs> if you don't know what turf you are uh, walking on. Okay? So I would like to stop there. Uh, we have time for discussion. Uh, I just want to give you a couple of websites. Uh, my lab at uh, on campus is gadgillab.berkeley.edu and a much larger effort at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab is the Institute for Globally Transformative Technologies, LIGTT.org and they have a non-profit, so if you just go to LIGTT.org you'll, you'll see that one and then um, I think I want to stop there and take questions. Thank you. So yeah, just please use the mics when you give a question. Hi. Um, it's often said that uh, development innovations work better if people, if the end users have to pay something for them than if they get them for free. <laughs> if the end users have? Have to pay something for them inst rather than getting them for free. And I think you indicated with regard to water purification that there was something like that going on where the distributor had an incentive to educate people about public health only if they were getting paid for the devices. Is, is that uh, a fair right. description? Absolutely. Absolutely right. And in fact, our preference uh, in, for the stoves program also would be even if the stoves are subsidized, they should, they should at least buy, they should do something for it. Uh, otherwise it's not valued. Now in Darfur, because it's a very special situation, uh, the stoves are given away free to the near destitute residents of camps. But outside the camps in Darfur villages, uh, there is still the same problem. There's still uh, a lot of hard work and, and need to get fuel efficient stoves. So we started selling stoves into the villages outside because ultimately they are going to be competing for the same fuel. 
and we find that we can sell them for full price. Uh, so out of the 40,000, stores, the f about first 30,000, I would say, are given away free to the camps. Uh, and the next 10,000 are being sold near full price, not fully at full price yet, but it's getting there. So definitely, I agree with you completely. Yeah. Um, my question is, uh, what is the possibility of recontamination of water? You're, provide, you're being able to provide pure water to all these uh, places, but there's also a high probability of recontamination of these uh, safe water, right? Very good question. Uh, the recontamination of water risk is about the same as drinking boiled water, right? You boil water, there is no residual left. So if you are sending that water down a pipe that is underground, there is a risk of infusion of contaminated groundwater into the pipe, contaminating that water. But if you carry that water in a small mouth bottle into which you cannot dip your hand or you cannot dip your pot, and you have to tip the bottle to get the water out, then there is no way to put stuff in. There is some risk somebody could spit in it, for example. I can't stop that. They could spit into their cup as well anyway, right? I mean, at some level, you can't stop... I'm, I'm not running a surgery. <laughs> I'm stopping diarrhea disease. <laughs> okay? So that was an important discussion because we had that debate as well. Saying what's the level of protection you are going to offer? What can you do and what you choose not to do? This is a really, really important question. Ultimately, when World Bank came down back in 1993, even before we started on the water project, saying putting, having to drink 500 CFU per liter is a metric of how much uh, colony forming units of, of E. coli you have in the water, which is a metric of fecal contamination. 500 CFU per deciliter of uh, contaminated water. As opposed to that, if you can bring that down to 10 CFU per deciliter, that will be a huge advance because body has some natural immunity anyway. Right? So I'm not designing something to be used in surgery. I'm designing something to protect people. And a lot of work has to go into this kind of strategic thinking. What you choose to do also defines what you choose not to do. So what is the point what is going to remain affordable and have a huge public health impact, but not perhaps do something... I mean, the water meets WHO standards as it comes out of the tap, and it also it comes out of the bottle, even when the bottle goes home, because there is no way to dip your hand in it or pot in it. But beyond that, you have to say something I can't do. Right? But good, good question. Thank you. Yeah. Is it me? <laughs> um, hi. In relation to the water filters and the stoves, were there any sort of cultural adoption objections that you weren't able to overcome? Uh, we were very sensitive. But all of this is teamwork. Even though I'm speaking, there's, there's, there's dozens of people behind each project, right? Uh, both in the case of stoves and in case of water, we haven't run into cultural adoption issues. The first water station that was built in Bominampadu was purposely staffed by so-called low-caste, untouchable members of the community. There was a lot of fight between the village council and the company about whether it should be in the Brahmin area or the low-caste area of the village. And the company decided to put it in the low-cost area and even staff it with low-cost, so-called low-cost people, saying, this is the way it is, take it or leave it. And it succeeded. So, it's doable. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Professor Gedgel. Uh, you've talked a lot about innovation in the developing world uh, and laws and rules and, and lessons that come from that. But it strikes me that one might leave thinking that it's a different reality, that there are different laws and different rules applying to, uh, to developed countries. Um, I'm not sure that's what you're trying to say, but why is it that, be it engineers or be it social scientists, continue to think that it's, the world works differently as soon as you cross a border? Very good question, George. I would, I would say that in the developed world, in the industrial world, part of our development has led to well-defined institutions, well-defined rule makers, regulators, uh, courts and legal systems and authorities that will intervene in the public interest. Uh, here is the Wild West. Uh, 
either institutions are undefined or they are dysfunctional or they are maybe on paper but not really, don't have real teeth. So in some sense, the person who is also designing something to disinfect water has to worry about <coughs> what standards you will meet and what, I mean, they may not exist any or they may be non-enforceable. There may be no agency that is staffed. So in, in some sense, we are, we are uh, a little bit in the, in the United States of the last century, early years on the West. <laughs> last, last question here. Um, thank you for your talk. Um, just following up on these, on the same theme, um, in, with the stove, you went to great extent, uh, to, to great, took great measures to understand what the women wanted and to, to adapt the tool to them and not try to make them, say, cook rice. But with the water, that wasn't really an option. And so the behavioral and the education was a big part of that. So they're sort of different approaches. Could you comment on that, on that a bit? Right. Uh, it's, it's a very important point and it's a subtle point because uh, cook stoves is a device that is going to be owned by the household. And at some level, we have to pay attention to the user's experience, not just with the food, but with the device. So places where we compromised with the stoves was we went for the lowest cost material that will deliver the performance, which is mild steel. Uh, mild steel looks very shiny in the beginning. It rusts within two weeks. So our experience is the women are very proud of the stove, even socially proud to the point of leaving it in near their door in the living room for the first two weeks. After that, it stays in the kitchen this is during the day. At night, they move the stove next to their bed because that's the most precious possession. They don't want to lose it. Uh, but, but it's now a material thing. Whereas water is just collected at this point. But at water also, I learned something from water health. Uh, my argument was to keep costs really low. I was pushing as their science advisor just to build something like a, a single car garage, like a concrete box in which they should place the equipment. The CEO of Water Health insisted on something that looks to be the most dazzling, beautiful building with glass walls. You saw that stuff, they said, out of this place, right? And I say, what are you doing? You're raising the cost, making it vulnerable, somebody throw stones. He says, no, 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 it's got to be aspirational. They must feel the experience that they are now entering essentially a first world environment when they come to the compound. And the look and feel must be of that caliber that they must feel that this is something they can trust, not just a filthy garage with a little hole in the wall from which you dispense water. And he was totally right. This is the right thing. So this is the kind of psychology I didn't learn. I didn't know, but I learned. <laughs> One last thing I want to say, if you have the time, is there is always an angle of what does it look at, what does it take on the inside to do all this, right? So I only told you the external view. There is also the angle of what is the internal view. How do you behave? What do you choose to do? What do you choose not to do to get to do projects like these? And I gave that talk at MIT when I got the MIT, the Lemelson MIT Prize in 2012 and MIT has put it on the web. It's very simple, MIT.tv and then the abbreviation. So that's something you may want to look at if you want to get to know more. There was one or we are beyond one o'clock, so now officially closed, I guess. Thank you. I'll be here for two more minutes, but thanks a lot. <laughs>